Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you all here this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're glad that you're here, and we hope that you take the words and the opportunity that we are given today and take it out of the world today. There have been many announcements scrolling on the board. Hopefully you've been able to catch some of them. If there's anything that you're involved with or need to do, make sure that you mark those on your list to do this week. Let's go ahead and worship and to our preparation thought, which comes from Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with, with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together this morning and worship you. We thank you for always being with us, for being that loud voice telling us that you are with us and that you are near us. May we take this opportunity today to learn more about you, to worship together, and to fulfill your commission of being disciples and spreading the word to all people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to read the words on the screen and ponder the meaning with the hymn, When the World is Called Up Yonder. This morning, a lot of times we don't do a lot with, with introductions, but I think maybe we need to uh, to this morning. So, uh, Devin and Jared Brow, if you would come forward, along with uh, 
along with the kids, Ethan and Hunter. If you want to, if you just kind of want to start over there at the, at the corner. Yeah. Uh, the Burrells had actually talked to me uh, quite some time ago, I think before the uh, COVID even hit, <laughs> uh, about joining our church. They are, are good, good friends uh, with Ben and Kate, I know, and, uh, and live uh, up in a community with some others of our, uh, some other young couples from our congregation. So we are glad to have the Burrells with us. Uh, Esther Dybert. Esther Esther has been worshiping with us a number of times recently. She's a good friend of Jean Rieger. She, uh, she was a member of the Snake Spring Valley Congregation. That was becoming uh, quite a bit of a drive in terms of distance and up over the mountains in the snow. And so she worshiped with us a number of times and, and felt good about being here. And so uh, we are happy to have her join with us as well. Chris Rhodes. And most of you know, Chris kind of married into the congregation. Uh, we're very pleased for, for he and Meredith, and uh, they have been uh, active. Chris has been active since their, since their wedding, and so we're, we're very pleased to welcome him. And then we have Matt, Christine Zane, and Sydney Snyder. Uh, of course, these folks have been associated with our congregation a good bit longer than I have. <laughs> uh, for sure. Matt being the, the son of Dale and, and Sandy Snyder, and uh, they have worshipped with us many times, and we're glad to have them here and become members as well. And then uh, the, uh, the Words family, uh, Walter, Lois, Jessica, and Ryan. Uh, I was caught a little bit off guard when they said they wanted to join our church, because I thought they already were. <laughs> I've always kind of uh, just... Uh, thought of you as members of our church, but you weren't officially, so now we'll, we'll make it official. And of course, you, you know the Words family and you know how involved they've been, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, be blessed by their music ability in, 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 just a, in just a moment here. Okay, those of you who have, have come, would you just face me for, for a moment here? As you are welcomed into our church, there are some vows that we ask that you take. They're a little bit similar to the vows that you may have taken at your baptism, and they just reaffirm your love for and loyalty to Jesus Christ and His church. Each of you has previously made confession of your faith in Jesus Christ and have been a member of His church. We rejoice in your decision to unite with this congregation in full covenant relationship with the believers who worship and serve God in this place. You now reaffirm your faith in and loyalty to Jesus Christ, our Lord, and his gospel. You may reply, I do. As you unite with this church, will you worship, serve, and share in its program, supporting it by your earnest prayers, regular attendance, loyal service, and faithful stewardship as God gives you strength? And you may answer, with God's help, we will. Do you promise to live and share with us in the bonds of Christian fellowship, giving and receiving Christian love, sharing and bearing one another's joy and pain? And again, you may answer, we do. I'm going to ask the congregation to stand. Will you welcome each of these brothers and sisters in Christ with joy and affection into this family of faith? Will you pledge to them your help, your prayers, and your concern, so that we may all increase in the knowledge and love of God? Will you trust God for strength with them to follow in Christ's way, keeping together the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? If so, will you answer, we will. You may be seated. On behalf of the Woodbury family, we welcome each of you in God's name. We pray that as we work and serve together, we may all grow in God's grace and in love for Him and for each other. Now, this would normally be a time where we do a lot of handshaking and give you your certificates. Again, we're kind of staying away from that. 
uh, but we do we do very sincerely welcome you this morning. Your certificates are in your mailbox, and if you checked your mailbox on the way in, they were put in afterwards, so they are in your mailbox. And again, we welcome you to this family of faith. Maybe see.
Thank you, Jessica and Ryan. We always appreciate your singing and also officially welcome to the fam. As Jessica said, we also welcome the rest of you to this body as well. We're very glad to have you. I invite you to stand for this morning's scripture, which comes from 2 Peter. And we'll be looking at chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? <clears throat> he promised. Ever since our father died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of the time was they lose and destroy. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is now slow in keeping his promise. It's not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed is coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. You may be seated. Let's again come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit with us today, in each day. We pray that you might just touch the words that you've laid on my heart. That you might anoint them, that you might speak them to each of our hearts in a way that we need to hear. In a way that we need to be reminded, in a, in a way that we maybe need to be built up for this week ahead. Just remind us of your truths and of your precious promises. And have your way. Change us where we need to be changed this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A young student from Africa was preaching his first sermon in an elementary preaching class. He chose a text describing the joys uh, of heaven, uh, what we'll share when, when Christ returns and we're ushered into eternal life. And he began his message with these words. He said, I've been in the United States for several months now. I, I've seen the great wealth that is here, the fine homes and, and cars and clothes. I've listened to many sermons in churches here too. But I've yet to hear one about heaven. Because people have so much in this country, no one preaches about heaven. People here don't seem to need it. In my country, people have very little, so we preach on heaven all the time. We know how much we need. In our affluent nation, where we are so materially blessed, where we have nice homes and cars and, and warm beds and TVs and computers and, and food stashed away, where we can hop on a plane and, and go to some kind of paradise sort of, of destination like Hawaii or, or whatever it might be for you. Perhaps we do tend to lose sight of our need for heaven. But when trouble comes into our lives, we're reminded just how important the presence of heaven really is. When death strikes a loved one or friend, when our health begins to fail or, or we deal with, with some kind of terminal illness, then we realize how much we need the promise of heaven. When our world begins to fall apart, 
we find that we need that promise of something bigger and beyond this life to hold on to. The early churches to whom Peter was writing needed the promise of heaven. They lived in a troubled world. They were being persecuted for their faith. Many of them had lost their homes and their possessions. Some had been thrown into prison. So Paul wrote to encourage them, to urge them to be watchful and prepared for the sure return of Jesus Christ. And he reminded them of this promise of a new heaven and a new earth. I want to break down our text this morning into three parts. First, we'll look at some preliminary events leading up to the day of the Lord. And then we'll talk about this new heaven and new earth. And then finally, we'll deal with the searching question that Peter asks his readers. What kind of people ought you to be? What kind of people ought you to be? As I look at our text, Peter talks about three events leading up to heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. Now, he's, he's not plumbing all the depths of all the prophecies that are out there. Uh, that's not his purpose, and, and that's not what I'm going to do either. We're going to keep it kind of simple. The first event that he talks about is the coming of scoffers. You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Well, while Peter uses that in a future tense, he's not actually referring to a future event. The apostles saw the days in which they lived as the last days. They were already warning their readers of, of scoffers and false teachers at work within the church. In Acts 20, Paul told the Ephesian elders, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Peter points out three things about these scoffers. First, they follow their own evil desires. They're slaves to sin and self. They're not concerned about following Jesus Christ. They've rejected his resurrection. They've rejected the judgment. They've rejected life after death. So, so if you've done that, you might as well indulge yourself in this life. Even Paul told the Corinthians, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The attitude of a scoffer. Second, they question Jesus' second coming. Where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Peter was probably writing 35 to 40 years after Jesus' death, and people were already saying, look how long he's been gone. He's, he's obviously not coming back. So I guess it shouldn't surprise us that nearly 2,000 years later, our world, our world loves to poke fun at those who talk about Jesus' return or, or the end of the age. And sometimes I think those within the church who insist on trying to put dates on Jesus' return do just as much damage as those who scoff at the idea of Him coming at all. With each prediction that fails, more and more people believe that it's not going to happen at all. Third, they deliberately forget God's role in history. They ignore the fact that long ago, by God's word, the world was created. And that after that, again, by God's word and water, the world was destroyed, except for the lives of, uh, of Noah and his family and the, the animals in the ark. When we refuse to accept God as creator of the world, and we refuse to accept his grand role in the history of this world, then it becomes sort of unreasonable to accept the biblical prophecies of his role in the end times. Our answer, our answer to the scoffers of this world must be that while we don't know the day or the time, we know with absolute certainty that Jesus will return. Over 50 times in the New Testament, we are warned to be ready for his return. The second preliminary event is the fulfillment of God's timetable. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. 
being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Everything in creation is being sustained by God through Jesus Christ. Right up to the time he has reserved for judgment, for the destruction of ungodly men, and the fulfillment of all that God has planned for his people. Why does God delay in coming? How, how bad is he going to let things get? Peter writes, don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. God has his reasons for delaying. And, and Peter gives us what certainly must be one of the most important of those. He said, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus hasn't come back to earth because there are many who belong to him who have not yet become part of his kingdom. And he isn't willing for them to go into a Christless eternity in hell. So he waits patiently for them to come to repentance. If you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus is, in a sense, waiting for you even now. But he won't wait forever. There will be a sudden destruction of the heavens and the earth. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. For most of, of our history, it's been difficult to imagine how the earth could be destroyed in this way, how, how the very elements could be consumed. But we've seen the devastation of, of a single nuclear weapon, which we've now produced in mass. And so we ought to understand that left to our own devices, we could probably accomplish that destruct, destruction ourselves. It's certainly not going to be a problem for God. It's never pleasant to think about the events described here, the destruction our, of our physical world and, and all the things that we're familiar with. We think of the great pain and suffering and trauma that will come to those who don't know Jesus. But as we think about those traumatic events that precede a new heaven and a new earth, we need to cultivate a faith and a relationship with God that is strong enough to see us through the beginning birth pains and, and to hold on to the promise of what's to come. And that promise is the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. That day will bring about the destruction of the heaven by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. The old heaven, the old earth have to be done away with to make way for the new. And it's new in quality and form. It's not just a recent copy of something that existed previously. The word new occurs many times in the book of Revelation, and every time it means new in form or nature, not just new in time as in recent. And this phrase, a new heaven or heavens and a new earth, is found four times in the Bible. It's found twice in Isaiah in terms of prophecy of things to come. Then in addition to our text, it's also found in Revelation 21. Verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read that. If you want to turn to that in your Bibles, uh, you, you can do so. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. 
Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This new heaven and new earth will be the home of righteousness. Continuing on, verse 8 in that, in that passage says, The cowards, the unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars will have no place there. There will be no injustice, no hatred, no persecution, no jealousy. There will be no self-serving pride, no prejudice, no wars. None of the evils that characterize so much of our world will be there. It will be a perfect place without suffering. John mentions that along with the, the old heavens and earth, the sea is also gone. For, for John read, John's readers back in the first century, they considered the sea an, an unnatural element, a place of, of danger and storms. It became a symbol of chaos, destruction, and death. So the fact for them that there would be no sea in heaven was a great comfort. John's other words of comfort we relate to easily. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. It's hard to imagine a world where there, there will be nothing even such as an, an upset stomach or a sinus, sinus headache or a bad cold to bother us. Much less the death of loved ones. No serious illnesses like COVID or cancer or Parkinson's. None of the unpleasant circumstances that we deal with routinely in this life. They'll all be gone. It will be a place of indescribable beauty. John attempts to describe the beauty of heaven in terms that we can understand, but I don't think there is anything short of our arrival and, and physical witness of that that will allow us to comprehend that beauty. Paul wrote, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. A little girl taking an evening walk with her father looked up at the stars and exclaimed, oh daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what must the right side be? Interesting thought. If the sky that we see at night, the wrong side of heaven is that beautiful, what must heaven be like? It will be the final fulfillment of all that God wanted for his prized creation. John paints the picture of a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The bride of Christ being joined to her husband. It says, in a loud voice from the throne says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That phrase should sound very familiar to you. Under the old covenant with the Jews, God told the people, If you obey my commands, I will put my dwelling place among you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. When they failed to obey, God set up a new covenant in Jesus Christ. He said, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. But his chosen people rejected him. And too many of us who have accepted him allow sin in our lives that break our communion with him. But in heaven, all of that will be gone. There will be no unbelievers. There will be no sin. There will be absolutely nothing between us and God. We will see him face to face. And finally, in every sense of the word, he will be our God. And we will be his people. In light of all this, what kind of people should we be? Given that everything around us will be destroyed by fire and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, a, a reward for us beyond our, our wildest imagination, how should we be living now? We should live holy and godly lives. It's no time for careless living. It, it's no time for putting things off, leaving things undone. It's time to get rid of the things in our lives that aren't pleasing to God. 
It's time to seek first the kingdom of God and let Jesus care for the rest because none of what we, what, uh, what we accumulate here on this world is going to last anyway. It's time to store up riches in heaven. It's time for urgency in living for Christ, following Him and living for Him. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant? whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. We need to be doing what God has given us to do. We should look forward to his return. Benjamin Reeves tells the story of a little boy whose mother had died and he had never been on a picnic. So he and his father made their plans for a picnic. They, they fixed the lunch and, and packed the car the evening before. When it was time to go to bed, the little boy's excitement just got the better of him, and he, he couldn't go to sleep. Finally, he, he got out of bed. He, he ran to his father's room and, and, and shook him awake. His father woke up and saw him and said, What are you doing here? What's the matter? The boy said, I can't sleep. The father asked, Why can't you sleep? And the boy said, I'm excited about tomorrow, Daddy. Father said, well, son, I'm sure you are. It's going to be a great day. But it won't be great if we don't all get some sleep. So why don't you just run down the hall, get back in bed, and get that sleep. So the boy trudged off down the hallway, but it wasn't long before he was back. What's the matter now? His father asked. The boy said, Daddy, I just want to thank you for tomorrow. And then Reeves, a man who could have easily died a Christless death, on the streets of Harlem, said this. When I think of my past and the fact that a loving father would not let me go, reached down in his divine province and lifted me off of the streets of Harlem. When I think of what he has done for me and then think that he is planning a new thing for me that will surpass the past, let the record show this night in this place that Benjamin Reeves testified Father, I want to thank you for tomorrow. Each one of us, as we look at our past, and even our present, and what God has in store for us in the future, ought to have that same kind of anticipation, that same kind of gratitude, thanking our Father for tomorrow. We should speed its coming. Kind of a difficult phrase. How can we possibly affect in any way, much less speed the fulfillment of God's timetable? It isn't God sovereign? Hasn't He already established those times and dates? Well, why is He holding back now? Because He wants more people to repent and come to know Him as Lord and Savior. So we need, again, to be doing the work that God has given us. We need to be spreading the gospel message and leading others to Christ. Jesus also said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. Finally, Peter says that we should make every effort to be found spotless blameless, and at peace with Him. And you might say, that's impossible, Pastor. I, I know myself too well. I can't be spotless. You're right. You can't, and neither can I. That's why we need Jesus Christ. That's why we need the new covenant in His blood, because it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sins that we can be spotless and blameless in the sight of God. It's only through putting our lives completely in His hands that we can be at peace with Him. Several hundred years ago, William III was trying to put down rebellion in northern Scotland. And he, he issued a proclamation to all the rebel chiefs to appear at a certain time on or before December 31st, 1691, and take an oath of allegiance to the king. Those who didn't take the oath would be treated as outlaws and put to death. There weren't many followers of these chiefs, so it was useless for them to rebel. One by one, they all gave in, and they signed their names to the paper, except for one. Mackeon, 
was the chief of the smallest and proudest tribes in Scotland. And he planned to sign the paper, but it was his intention to be the very last of the chiefs to give in. So he waited till a day or two before the deadline, and then he began to make his way to that place to sign. But he was interrupted by a powerful snowstorm, and he didn't arrive until a week later. He and all of his followers were executed as traitors. Many people tried to play the same game in terms of accepting Christ. They want to wait until the, the last minute because they want to do their own thing as long as they can. And I wonder how many have experienced a very bad outcome, dreadful consequences of waiting too long. Bishop Ryle said, Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And they that enter shall find that they are neither unknown nor unexpected. Are you prepared for a new heaven and a new earth? Is there a place there that has been prepared for you? Let's come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. An eternal home prepared for us. For we will see you face to face where the evil and the struggles and the trials of this world will become a distant memory. And we will just rejoice in your presence. I pray that in light of the promise that our lives would reflect a love, a gratitude, a devotion, a desire to serve you and to be the people that you've called us to be. That we might be ready, that we might be prepared for that time. And I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who has, has never taken a step of accepting you and, and claiming that promise, I pray that this morning might be a time to do so, Heavenly Father. To open their hearts and lives to you. they might have the assurance of this great promise that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Closing him that I chose for our reflection, um, I, I gathered from some that it is perhaps not a, a familiar song. Uh, and maybe that's not a bad thing, because then you'll have to reflect a little more on the words. But I, I hope this will speak to you. It gives a hymn from our hymn book called Face to Face.
grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. 